as I'm getting out of the Marine Corps, so the guy was supposed to do my interview for my checkout to get out of the military. So he's like, what do you want to do with your life plazas? And I was like, well, shit, I want to be an engineer. I'm going to do this, that, this. He looks at me and he's just like, why are you going to do that shit? So immediately I was like, what are you doing that's so special that you're criticizing my plan? And he was like, I'm an investor. And right now I'm actually making more money from my investing than I am with the military. And by the time I get out, I'll probably be making twice as much as I'm making with the military. What is investing? How does that work? And he, uh, he told me to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> right? Welcome to the good life. Welcome back to another episode of the Good Life Visual Audio Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, C. Muzan. I got Coach. I got Kabi here in the building. Say what's up, man. That's right, coach. That's right, coach. What up, though? Shout out. Ah, oh, man, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It uh, feels like a Monday for me. I had a friend listen. come into town, you know, as you know, mm -hmm. young Dougal. Mm -hmm. So it was like half vacation and half not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, let me tell you this. Don't half, don't half anything. <laughs> no, no halves no halves right only a hundred percent should have gone a hundred percent vacation y'all didn't hear from me till today <laughs> <laughs> you're learning you're learning the lessons young young yeah. jedi like it's <laughs> it's it's important to see like hey uh mixing the business and the pleasure sometimes doesn't always work out the way no. that we want to right it doesn't it doesn't you you, you get you get 50 percent of both which you it doesn't really feel right <laughs> but anyway how you doing brother Man, life is good. Life is good. I keep saying it. The sun is shining. The East Coast finally lives again. No, give, them, give, give, give them a little sun. They think they're California. <laughs> Listen, you want us to be so badly like California anyway. <laughs> no, right? no. So yeah. at least we get a little sunshine. At least we get a little bit of uh, vitamin D. So that's been a blessing. Uh, but yeah, life is good. April's financial literacy month. So we're in the, th the, the, the thick of things right now, educating people financially. So that's a real big deal. It's something we got, we've been doing a lot of conversations, having a lot of conversations, going live, lots of different places. This month specifically, we're talking finances. So uh, that kind of leads in a little bit to our show today, right? We're going to talk a little finances. Got a special guest coming in a little bit later. Our two by two. Two by two. Today, we're talking about AI, right? This AI race and the threat of all this deep fake and technology, uh, other types of technology that's happening. I don't know if you've been seeing this, man, but it's a big deal. This deep fake technology uses AI and uh, other algorithms to like manipulate audios and videos. So basically you can paste or like recreate somebody's sound, whether that be in music, whether that be a speech, but this deep fake technology is being widespread and People got some mixed thoughts on it, man. So what are your thoughts on this, man? Is this then on? <laughs> listen, listen, pull close to your speaker, to your television screen. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? Once again, we are missing the point. I think we've got to go one step further, maybe two steps further for some folks, and ask the question, who are the gatekeepers of information and are we satisfied with the way that things are already set up now see some of that is uh we we can't backtrack as a former history teacher i'll tell you this there is maybe this amount of history in the world and we know this amount of it and we're allowed to talk about this amount of it and we teach this amount of it <laughs> right <laughs> so you know when we talk about this deep fake it's i think what we're really getting to here is a question of what is real information what's authentic information and i think as long as we continue to have a system in place where there are gatekeepers right that have access to and determine what it is that is available for people to uh, interpret on their own i think we're going to have issues i've said this for a long time i, I do really believe in open source uh, open source information. I think it's now that it's possible, right? And it, it's been possible for a while, for a long time. It was the gatekeepers were, you know, let's be honest, it was, it was the church, right? Specifically mm -hmm. the Catholic church, control education, control medicine. Um, and, and they decided what was okay, what wasn't okay. Government, gatekeeper, they decided what's okay, what isn't okay. You can't decide, right? And a lot of parents try this. You can't decide what your kids actually like dive into when you let them off to public school, even private school. I taught in private school saying mm -hmm. the politics are strong. Mm -hmm. right? So 
I think this is a box. It's a Pandora's box that was opened a really long time ago, and we're asking the wrong question. The question we should ask is, are you happy with the way that things, the gatekeepers are setting up the things now? How you get your information, what you have access to? Because it's already limited, right? Mm -hmm. And whether or not it's true, it's real, it's back, that's going to be harder and harder to answer as we move forward. From my side, right, I think this AI movement, I think there's a ton of technology that's going to be incredibly helpful. But this deep fake side, this uh, being able to copy somebody's voice or copy somebody's likeness and just literally be able to put it together can run into its own problem from national security to global security. Like, how do we know what's real? It feels like there's like an attack, an attack on like how we get our information or like what information we believe. And that's a scary place. Better than where it was before, where only a few people held the information anyway. Now it's just it's getting to a place where how do you know what to trust or what to listen to? I think there's going to be some definite positives that come from it, but also a ton of negatives on the other side. I think we just have to see how it plays out. So. Let us know your thoughts. I'll be super curious if you're hearing this. What are your thoughts? Who do you, who do you agree with? Typically it would be me, but we're not going to go. <laughs> Whatever. Um. <laughs> Let's get a chance to dive in. We got a special another special guest for you today on the show. Um, it's Man, we're at episode 114. Again, we want to introduce people to you that are going to bring value and continue to add to the community. Uh, and let's just have some conversations around the, the good life, the things of the good life, health and wealth. Um, and this gentleman that we have coming on is definitely going to be able to uh, have have some of the, these conversations with us. And uh, Kabi, go ahead and introduce. You know, one, one amazing thing about uh, doing business online is you get to meet individuals who maybe aren't in your immediate vicinity, uh, but are like-minded individuals. And then we should, when we find individuals like that, we try to bring them on a show. There he is, um, uh, founder of Seven Figure Vet. And uh, he's going to speak more on that, entrepreneur. And he's got a really interesting story and some really, uh, I think, insights that we align on in terms of uh, the show as a whole uh, ownership. And I think he's got some really cool insights to give. So I'm super excited to have him here. Uh, Mr. Plazas. Did I, say, did I say that right? Yeah, pla but it just depends on what country you're in. You know what okay. I mean? Out here, there would be like plazas. But uh, <laughs> out in the States, plazas is fine. I like that. I like, see, it's kind of, kind of very similar, actually, because a lot of people see my name. They're like, oh, Kobe, right? But but when you say it with a Ghanaian accent, all of a sudden it sounds like a totally different. It's a Kobe, right? <laughs> I, I, I was thinking it was good more towards the span, como Kobe. But yeah, uh, yeah, Kobe, yeah. That's right. a whole different world. Yes, but thank sir. you for having me here, guys. I appreciate you guys bringing me on here. And I appreciate everybody that's watching uh, for, for taking the time to watch us and to listen to us. Absolutely, man. We appreciate. Uh, and, man, we just want to open up. David, kind of give you the floor. Like, introduce yourself to everybody. Again, I know you and uh, Kabi have had some conversations. Uh, but but let people know kind of a little bit of your background, a little bit of who you are. Born in Colombia. Born in South America. Um, very lower middle class. Uh, in Colombia, which is kind of like dead broke in the States. Um, when I was three years old, my parents decided to move to the States um, to go and find the American dream. Um, and, you know, it was it was just I, I don't know. Sometimes I tell a story and I feel like it's so normal. But then I remember how important it is for other people to relate. So, you know, when we first got to the to, to United States, it was like three full families, grandparents and everything um, in a two bedroom apartment. Um, and you know, that it was just that, that going on for about like a year, year and a half until my family was finally able like my mom and dad were able to like get an apartment, um, around like seven or eight, my, my parents split up. And so living alone with my mom, we had to move to like lower income places and, uh, being around that, having kind of like a mom that was working all the time. I, I got surrounded by drugs, violence, gangs, guns, this, that. Um, and when I was about 18, right. So when I was, uh, like six months of graduate before graduation, um, I had a uh, a really close friend of mine. His name's Tony. Um, he, we were in class together, and he had invited me to a party that night. It was right over right right by my house. So I I, to I told him I wasn't probably going to be able to make it. A um, couple hours into the party, there was a drive by. Some guys came by, let off two shots, caught him in the head. By the time it, because it was so close, I was able to just come to the house saw that whole thing come down. His mom showed up. You can just imagine the, like the voices and the stuff. It's heavy. And so you were, you were, you were 18 at this time, 
I was like 17, 18. No, I was 18 because I remember I, I dropped out of school that Monday. So and I, this I, is and this is in Colombia. No, no, no. This is this is in the states. Oh, this is in the states. This is in Orlando. Orlando, got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah. So Monday showed up to school. There was a, a like a fight because of that conversation that I got in. They tried to suspend me, and I just dropped out. I was like, I need to get the fuck out of here. I can't be here anymore. There's a lot of people getting into drugs, like heavy Percocets and stuff like that. And Xanax, super, super heavy. And um, and so I hit up the Marine Corps. Like I hit up the Marine Corps recruiters and I was like, I don't know what I need to do or how I need to do it, but I just need to get out of here. However it is, that you, whatever you need to sign me, if it's to work as a cook, to clean up bathrooms, whatever, inf- infantry, you want me to go shoot, it doesn't matter, bro, get me the hell out of here. And so they were like, uh, they were like, just stay in the office. If you can stay in the office and be here, if there's any contracts that people that don't, that don't do their ship, we'll send you out. I ended up leaving before my, like, grad. so my class, I had to get a, like, I had to do the, the a DBI program mm-hmm. to get the GED. Mm-hmm. And so I did my DBI program in like a couple of weeks while everybody was still in school. I finished. And then I was just sitting in the Marine Corps office. They sent me out, um, literally graduation. So I, I, as everybody was graduating, I was heading to Tampa to get registered into the Marine Corps. Um, went to the Marines, learned how to be a man. You know, I really, I, the Marine Corps was one of the most important things in my life, I think. You know, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of mentors um, and the, the way, where it all changed, right? So grew up, broke my whole life. My mom never made more than a thousand dollars, like just no financial literacy whatsoever. As I'm getting out of the Marine Corps, um, I, most people, when they get out of the military, they try to create this like super complicated plan. Like I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to get the certificate and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that so that I can become a real estate agent. Right. They go and they add just a whole bunch of unnecessary things to do something. And so I did the same. And unluckily for me or luckily for me, I had a gunny. I had a, an E7 who did my interview instead of the guy that was supposed to. So the guy was supposed to do my interview for my checkout to get out of the military. He's not supposed to know me, but he wasn't there. So somebody that did know me had to do it. And it was this old black guy from New Orleans. His name is Gunny Thompson. And he talked like this. He was just like, he's just, it was a funny guy. And, <laughs> and so he's like, what do you want to do with your life plazas? And I was like, well, shit, I want to be an engineer. I'm going to do this, that, this. And he was like, and he literally, and, and it's so funny because I talked to so many military members now and I just feel so much like from where he was coming from. But he looks at me and he's just like, why are you going to do that shit? (laughs) And most of us are there. We try to build up this plan because we don't want anybody to tell us. So immediately I was like, what the fuck do you mean? What am I, what what are you doing? That's so special that you're criticizing my plan. You know, like, what are you doing? And he, he mentioned real estate investing and he was like, I'm an investor. And right now I'm actually making more money from my investing than I am with the military. And by the time I get out, I'll probably be making twice as much as I'm making with the military. And I was like, investing. I didn't even know what an asset was, right? At this time, I never read a book, never, none of that. I was just some kid that joined the Marine Corps, like just very stupid. And I was just like, what is investing? How does that work? And he, uh, he told me to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, <laughs> right? Uh, everybody, <laughs> the typical story, you know? And uh, started thinking, okay, I need to figure out investing, right? Like however it is that it works, started taking courses, mentorships, everything that I had saved up, you know, everything that I had saved up was like 12,000 or something like that from the military. In the first like seven months, I burned it either through trying to trade or through taking mentorships or through taking courses or whatever, just because I was reading the books and they were just like, bro, you have nothing to lose. Just put it all into that shit. It'll pay off in the long run. By the time it was like 2020, right right before the, the COVID thing, I, I, I understood it, right? I figured it out. I was like, all right, cool. This makes sense. And so when COVID hit, I knew what to do, right? I knew that everything dropped and I understood how it works. So I just sent out a bunch of messages to all my buddies in the Marine Corps. And I told them, buy this airline, buy this airline, buy this airline, buy this airline. They all put $1,000 here, $1,000 there. All together with everybody's money, we made probably like 250,000 in a matter of like three months, just from the bump, right? So everybody put in their money all together. It was like 250,000. And everybody was like, bro, teach me. And I, I did. And that was the birth of six figure vet. And Still. now we're here. <laughs> Moving from Columbia at the age of three with your family to it sounded like Orlando. Um, mm-hmm. First and first and foremost, you know, as uh, somebody who immigrated, you know, from Ghana, uh, a little bit older, around nine or so. I know uh, it can be 
it's it can be a very monumental thing that ha that occurs right now you were a little bit younger so maybe it wasn't quite the same for you but you expand on that a little bit like what you know what if any you know impacted uh being uh an immigrant uh have on your on on your the m mindset that you've crafted that's allowed you to be successful two major things right one of the big things for me is I was so young that I, I I'm more American than I am Colombian, right? Mm -hmm. I when in and so where I grew up, I grew up in an immigrant zone, right? So everywhere, everybody that I knew was either from Jamaica, from Haiti, from Venezuela, from Ecuador. We were all from other places, and so you can you can you could separate in school. We had the mira miras, that's what they called them, which were the 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 people that just got here. Right. Like they just got <laughs> off the plane. They just got off the boat. They're still speaking the language. And then there was people like me, which we were like we were more American. Right. Like all my friends were Hispanic, Puerto Rican, Dominicans. But we never in our lives ever spoke Spanish to each other ever. Right. Mm -hmm. We were just like, well, I don't know. It just we weren't really like that much to the to the to the culture. And so it wasn't as aggressive. But you always have that reference. Mm. Right. The only people in America were mom and dad. Right. So grandma, grandpa, every uncle, every aunt, every cousin was still there. And you could still reference the difference in the world. You know what I mean? So yeah. one of the big advantages that I'll always say is just. I've never so I'll say it like this, right? I've never met. It's difficult, to say, but we got to keep it real, right? We, I've never <laughs> met anybody who is American, legal. Caucasian, fair in the skin, um, with both parents at home that hasn't thought that they come from the grind, you know, that think that they're struggling. Everybody across the entire board, no matter where you go in, in the food thing, they all think that they have it the worst. Mm. And one of the privileges for us personally is knowing that we, that we really do have it mm. so good. You know what I mean? Like when you understand what, 80% of humans experience in their day to day and how, even if you're in the hood, you got warm water, you know, you have a pool. I grew up in a lot of places where there's shootings all the time, but we still had a pool, a community pool that was clean. Sure. You know what I mean? Like we had access to education where like a bus came. So yeah. I would say the biggest thing for me was just being able to reference how privileged I really was being in America. Yeah. Do, do, did you ever think at a young age that you'd be in the financial space or you'd get into money or investing or like none of that stuff ever had ever crossed your mind, huh? I thought I was going to be a barber. <laughs> I swear to God, because where I, like I said, so where I grew up, the only people that I ever saw that had money were the guys that were barbering or they were selling drugs. And I never wanted to sell drugs. I ne I just never, that never, ever like really called my, my attention. And so I would see the barbers and they always had, you know, some nice sneakers. They, they had a car, <laughs> you know what I was saying? Like they always had cash on them. So I was just like, I could be a barber and that shit will be straight. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's, that's, that's very, very true. Now. So if you, if you had no, um, you mentioned being in the military, right? And and part of being in the military was uh, your access to mentors. Uh, now we talk about that quite a bit here on the show: uh, mentoring, coaching, getting somebody who's who's uh, maybe even just a few steps ahead of you to kind of make the the, the path a lot more clear. And now you've ended up kind of being in a role where you are coaching and you are mentoring as well. So clearly, you you would agree that it's 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 very important. But how did you find? your mentors or did they find you and, and and how did you create that relationship with them where you were getting that that value that clarity that helped you kind of kind of get get on, on on the path i think it's always uh i think it's a little bit of combination of two things right so you'll always have the the rule of the tribe right and so a lot of people in the military are what, what, what do you mean by that so we like to help the people that look like us, that sound like us, that we relate to, right? And so it'll always be easier for you to see somebody that might be in your same situation and you'd be like, come here, come here, come here, guy. Let me let me help you out here. Um, and so because of that, and because of the way that the military is, there's a lot of people that were exactly like me, you know, little, little wannabe thugs out here just trying to fight with everybody, starting problems everywhere they can. <laughs> so a lot of them were just like, shut up. Like you're, you're stupid, you know? And I think 
it's bro you're just lucky in the military it's, it's you're just lucky like you don't even have to pick them right like i remember my best mentors were just people that they happen to be in my unit and if you're just fucking up you know left and right if you're late here if you're late there they're gonna chew you out and good or bad or indifferent you know those things are extremely necessary for an 18 year old who thinks he's the shit that's a big deal like i think you know th there's a reason why people go into the military, go into the armed, armed services, right? Like at the end of the day, um, you know, having disciplines and putting structure into one's life, especially a young man, like that's incredibly important foundationally. And for a lot of people, and it, obviously it sounds like yourself, David, like the military was able to do that for you, right? If you didn't have that beforehand, now you get some form of structure and discipline and like this is how i'm supposed to do things like you said become a man and uh i think i think that that's a huge benefit right that's a huge benefit and it makes sense that you would find mentors in the military because there are men that have been there for a very long time and women right that have been there for a very long time to then be able to give you guidance and to say hey we've been here for 15 20 years so you can take some of their uh wisdom along with you so uh sounds like the military really kind of shifted your perspective on life yeah yeah i mean i i saw the world seeing the world was a big one right because unfortunately you're a product of your environment and if you don't ever leave you're you're gonna be doomed to it but Another thing was just seeing how not special rich people were, right? Because not everybody in the military is- Break is, that down. Break that down. There you go. Yeah. So <laughs> not everybody in the military comes from broke families. You know, a lot of them are just Yankee doodle dudes that are like from Texas that always <laughs> wanted to serve their country, right. but their parents are like brain surgeons or their parents are, are business owners that have like a lawn mowing company that makes 2.5 million a year. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you meet their parents, when you meet these people and you're interacting with them and you like, oh, yeah, yeah, my dad makes 250K. And it's just like, what the fuck? $250,000. How the hell you did that? And then they just explain it. And you're just like that. That's not that difficult. That's yeah. that's actually not that hard at all. And then you meet their parents or then you meet, you know, somebody who's like the gunny, like Gunny Thompson. Oh, my God. Gunny Thompson. He's a multimillionaire guy, multiple trucks, farm and everything simplest dude you'll ever meet in your life like when i say simple i mean he's just a simple guy and so that for me is just like okay cool like if he could do it i could do it absolutely being able to you know uh what does it say like wealth wealth isn't always flashy right people that are rich most times right the the, the book the millionaire next door right just understanding the habits and and traits of uh people that actually do have a net worth right a good net worth because they they don't need the, the same things that other people that kind of use money to show off or right to buy clothes and those types of things they they wouldn't do the same thing so that lesson has to be learned at some point right by most people that lesson has to be learned it's cra crazy interesting man because I, I was um i i met you guys know the uh the gas station in texas uh bucky's i think it's called bucky's yeah I know yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So big, big one. Yeah, yeah. So the owners, all right, and like literally would never like uh oh met someone that works for them, and they were telling me about the whole the whole situation, sort of what's going on. And I mean, like, would never pick them out, blue jeans, whatever, but our their their the cash flow is insane, right? So I think about something like that. I'm like, ah, there's there's a lot of those kind of walking around to your to your point that we don't they don't, they don't signal themselves out etc but the point i want to ask actually was uh backtrack a little bit here uh rich dad poor dad was also a fundamental book in in uh my yeah so sort too. of uh yeah for you for you as well chris yeah yeah me too for sure yeah Dang. and i <laughs> and i think that's such a huge one so i wanted you to expand a little bit on that especially you know before we go into to to your business a little bit like what was it about Rich Dad or Poor Dad that really broke open the dam for you? And then do you have any other books that you followed up with to really open it up further? You could see behind you guys, us, like that's the only way to do it. Yes, sir. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad for me, you know, it, it just showed what was possible for me more than more than like actually being, you know, something that you should follow. Because I think it's it's actually a little counterintuitive 
to follow Rich Dad Poor Dad and look for eight streams of income and try to do Forex, try to do this, try to do that, do a whole bunch of things. I think it's a little counterintuitive, but what it did do is it just helped me realize that, yes, you can learn investing when you're 13. Yes, you can trade stocks and do this and that. Yes, you can buy real estate. And there are a whole bunch of regular people that just figured out marketing and were able to run a business and scale it. I think it gives such a good foundation for people. It's literally the first book I give to people that want to become entrepreneurs also. Uh, one of the, you know, I think if I remember correctly, it's uh, uh, rule number one is uh, the, the rich don't work for money right? The rich don't work for money. So when you do open a book with that, it literally changes the way you think about money right away. It shifts it, right? And then just understanding um, the mindset between being an employee and an entrepreneur, that's really the heart of the book, right? Yeah. The, the, heart, the heart of the book is like, you know, because again, there's probably some people out here that haven't read the book and it's super instrumental in almost every entrepreneur's life. I haven't talked to anyone that's like anywhere that's actually worth being that hasn't. That hasn't read it. Yeah, that hasn't read it because it really does give I you that, to one. that perspective. Really? And they have a lot of money. It's, it, it also tells me it's something <laughs> totally different, like uh, similar to what you were saying in terms of rich people aren't that special. Sometimes they also aren't that smart. Right? Yeah. But it's, I, crazy. I, I, it's crazy. It really is. It's it really more. is. It really is. It's, 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 to, to your point, I still, I think why Rich Dad Poor Dad and Keen so successful is because it's about everything that we take on has a mindset component, right? So for a long time, you know, working with my clients and I would spend quite a bit of time working on mindset. But I didn't call it mindset. I didn't really realize it was mindset. I just knew like if you were thinking that way, you're not going to be successful in hitting your your physical transformation goals or any other goals for that matter. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you mentioned that you had some um, some other other books as well, man. I'd love to get some maybe towards the end of uh, towards the end of this, drop some recommendations for what you put out for for, for your clients. But I would love to, Chris. Let me know if you do. I would love to get into like six figure vet. Like, yeah, we in. talk a lot about hitting that stage where you have some extra income or 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 what you've established cash flow you're at a point where you can uh, start a business and i think a lot of people think about business in the sense of if i'm starting a business it has to be something that's venture backable it's going to go public you know I, and when you even talk about investing i think a lot of people automatically go to to stocks and trading stocks etc i think there are tons of people who know nothing about trading stocks that have made a lot of money in real estate or they made they know nothing about real estate made a lot of money in, in stocks etc like take us to the the the, the actual uh, um why you chose this particular path in the world of investing what is like what is your general philosophy break that down for me a little bit yeah so um consulting so as far as investing goes right anybody who sells you investing or anything as if it's uh, a source of income is just selling you shit because mm. the way that investing works is it's a relative growth to how much you put in. Right. So if, if you truly want to utilize investing to its maximum ability, you have to put in compound interest, right? So compound interest in health, you guys go more towards health. The key component to getting compound interest in anything that you're doing in health is time. Right. Time and just maintaining there, just boom, 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 consistently doing it. That's the only way that you get that explosion after a long period of time. The same way it happens with Not steroids. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't. Go ahead. And so and so uh, I got it now. I didn't get it, but then I got it. I got it now. But um, but yeah, so with investing, the with investing and with trading, the only way for you to truly be successful is if you allow it to compound over time and you don't take out anything. Right. So the idea is for you to create cash flow and then have that money work for you so that you're not sitting it in an account like rate, like a savings account or even a certificate of deposit that's going to pay you like two percent. Because right now, inflation's at 14. Right. So I, I knew that I had to create some type of stream of income for my investments to work. And I mean, there's this really awesome parable that I learned um, that, that talked about, like, who made the most money during the gold rush? Those that designed acts for the picks, <laughs> the guy that sold the pick, right? So technically, whenever it comes to any type of investing and in real estate courses, any type of education, there's people that are looking for gold, 
right? That's really what it is. And unfortunately, I try to be as transparent as possible with my students. And I try to tell them like, you can do anything that you set your mind to, but don't try to make a thousand out of a hundred, you know, don't, don't gamble with your money because can you go to the casino and make a thousand dollars in a night? Sure. Of course you can, you know, of course you can. So, can so, you- so what's oh, my fault, man. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so, so, so what's, what exactly are you teaching the, the students? I teach them how to invest, right? Okay. So Warren Buffett is the most successful investor that ever existed, right? $110 billion. And he did it through a specific way. And the way that I like to teach them and the way that he does it is value investing. Yeah. Right. Understanding the financials, you know, where are their debt to income ratios and how to read that shit, right? How to actually get into the financials and understand why it's going positive, why it's cash flowing, why it's maybe not. And then also how to read trends and patterns just to make more educated decisions, right? It's not so much about timing the market. It's just understanding that certain things are, are going to have higher probabilities and lower probabilities. So mm-hmm. if we're at a certain price point, like an all-time high, in every market, when you get to the highest point, you're more than likely going to have a drawback, right? So just understanding how those patterns work so that you can make more educated decisions over time. And more importantly than anything, in my opinion, is so that you can have like the mental and emotional fortitude to when you have those drops in the market to when you have a recession, you don't emotionally sell at a loss and you're able to hold on because we know that the market will always play out over time. <laughs> the the investing game, the, the, the investing game can sometimes be frustrating for people uh, because it's a lot of terminology. It's a lot of things that sometimes, again, we don't get taught. Think about your own story, right? Dave, like you didn't hear the word investing until you hit your 20s, right? Right. Or, so that's where most people are. And so it's a little bit scary for people to kind of go go down that path. Um, what are you seeing is like a common like kind of drawback or people are saying like, uh, you know, is it because I can't manage my mind or I can't manage my emotions or I can't pick up the how to read a performer or per, a prospectus, right? Like what, what are you seeing as like the problems for people kind of getting through this investing hurdle? Honestly, I think that it's, it's it's so sad. It's just they don't know. You know, once you once you explain how the market works always, it's it's pretty simple and it's just a matter of understanding what you're putting your money into and not going in it as a gamble. Yeah. So the biggest struggle is really like when I talk to people, right? When I talk to veterans and stuff like that, why aren't you investing? I don't have enough capital. How much money you guys saved? 5,000. What the fuck? You could have started with 50. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you'd be like, oh, you know, why, what's the biggest thing stopping you from investing? Oh, man, I'm going on a deployment right now and I just don't have enough time to be watching and doing this. I'm, you buy and you hold. You don't, you don't watch this shit. You don't, you're not a, a Wall Street broker that's trading, you know, on, on the boards. Like all you're going to do is purchase stocks and hold them. Right. And, it, and it's just that. It's just a, a list of just mental barriers that I can imagine they heard throughout their whole life about the stock market and movies from their parents, stuff yeah. like that. I agree. Mm. I agree. I think a lot of it's really just education or lack thereof, right? It's something I believe in a ton uh, because I am also in like in the financial space, right? So being a financial coach and kind of going down the path with people, the the real problem that I always see is, like you said, a lack of capital. But that lack of capital also comes from a lack of education on like how to keep the money that comes in, right? How to make more, right? Like that there's a lack of education. Um, and so that's really the big the big part of it, because if people can get educated about how to build a proper foundation and just make sure that they do have a healthy cash flow, a healthy, uh, you know, savings rate and investing rate. Well, then, you know, good things will be able to happen. But I think no. that's the key. Right. It's no. the education. Uh, I take it back. You know, I take it a little bit back because at the same time, I don't know if you guys agree with me or not. I, I'd actually more want to hear your opinion. You know, I talk to a lot of people that they've heard, they've heard a lot, you know, like I was talking to a kid yesterday and I was just, he was like, I'm, I'm just depressed. You know, I always want to do things, but it just doesn't, I just don't do it. And I'm like, all right, bro, this is what you want to do. You want to eliminate this type of music, this type of this. You want to do this in the morning. You want to get this amount of sunlight and that'll allow you to da, 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 da. You have a fixed. And so he was just like, you just have a fixed belief on the fact that you can change things with doing da 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 And like, I think that he had heard what I said enough to where he had already built up a counter argument that he wanted to sit in because he genuinely wants to feel like he wants people to feel sorry for him. 
You know, he wants people to feel sorry for him. He wants his girl to feel sorry for him. And I just saw it like throughout the conversation. I was just listening to him. I'm like, you know what the fuck you have to do. You just have a good argument so that you can stay right where you are and so that you can continue to get that little sympathy and pity that you get from the people that are probably around you. Um, yeah, information overload, information mm -hmm. overload and paralysis. Because I would say this, uh, David and um, uh, Chris, is that I, I don't, I oftentimes wonder, is it a question of like, do they, people have enough information or do they, do they have almost like too much information and they can't decipher between what is good information and what is bad information. So as a result, they don't even act, right? Yeah, they don't say, not. or we don't, I don't even act, right? Because I, I, I can speak for myself, right? Same. <laughs> yeah. Same. The, you know, you guys com comment on that, but kind of for both of you guys, since you're both in the financial space, you know, when is an individual ready to start investing? What are the what is the checklist? And when is an individual maybe not ready to, to start inv investing? Because I do run to your point. I do run into a lot of indiv individuals. They don't have a job. They don't have income. They don't have anything. And, you know, they're looking to start buying stocks. And, and <laughs> it's not that's not really my field or what I do. But to me, that sounds kind of like silly. <laughs> right. Or, you, you, you know, you don't know anything and you think you're going to strike it rich because you start buying stocks. Yeah. No, what David, do you guys I, say to that from both of you? Listen, ahead, I, Chris. Yeah, Chris. I have I have my own thoughts on it because, again, I see it all the time, too. Right. And it's it's just this mindset of getting rich quick or understanding that, like, I want it right now. That's what most people and we're talking younger people most most times. Right. You get a little age and maybe a little wisdom on you. You start to understand that investing is a long term thing. Right. But sometimes if you can't grasp that, it becomes this short term mindset of just like you said, could be I don't have a job. I got this little bit of money. I'm trying to turn this hundred into ten thousand by investing in these stocks. Right. Yeah. And that's just the mindset. But that's the opposite of how we build wealth. Right. And so that's the mindset that normally we're catching people in is that, oh, I'm trying to do it quickly. And so if we can er erase that side of things, it gets rid of that depression. Like that kid said, like, oh, I'm depressed. Well, you're depressed because you're looking at other things or trying to move faster than what you right, are actually capable of moving. And it's, it's depressing you. But if you can rid yourself of that, change the mindset and how we think about it, I think then, you know, we can, we can make some changes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think as far as when when should we start investing? I think I think you can learn enough about investing to start investing with a simple path to wealth. That's a book. So if there anybody that's listening right now, just with that book, you have enough information to start investing. Second recommendation is make sure we get that in the show notes, Humbo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely you just with that book, you can start investing. And then The Richest Man in Babylon, I don't know if you guys read it, but he says pay oh, yourself. Yeah. That's a beautiful book. And the way that it's told is so great. And so, you know, you want to get that extra piece of gold. You want to get that 10% and don't put it in a savings account if you understand how to use, you know, the S&P 500 or, or something that's just really like it's not the most sexiest thing in the world, but it's going to keep you above what inflation is burning your money at. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I, I got this, this critical question that has to be asked from both of you guys real quick. You know, how, how do you both feel about, about, uh, you know, the advice given by my good uncle, uh, David. Ramsey? <laughs> <laughs> uncle Dave. <laughs> Chris is a hater. Bro. David, are you a hater of uh, uncle Ramsey as well? Or grandpa Ramsey, I should say. I, I think that he doesn't, I think that he has advice that he wouldn't take himself. For his own business. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> he ain't spicy, man. Listen. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Floor is yours. Let me back up. It's kind of like <laughs> insulting his actual uncle, David. So just don't mind. <laughs> but like he really takes offense. He really nah, takes so offense. Dave Ramsey is good for the 80, right? So 80% of, of the human population should listen to, to Dave Ramsey because that's what's going to allow you to, you know, to, to stay out of debt, accumulate wealth, do all that type of stuff. But I think that if you want to become a millionaire fast, you can't, you just can't, you can't, you have to take on debt. You have to take high risks. You have to go broke five times just because that's just like that. Genuinely, that's just how I feel. I feel like if you want to have a house vacation twice a year, 
kids go to a decent school, two cars, you know, that type of thing, Dave Ramsey's the way to go. But if you're trying to be like that dude, like a billionaire or like, you know, living in Colombia making fucking $50,000 a month or crazy shit, like you're just, you can't, you can't, you can't save your way to, to that. It's just difficult. I think, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, Kobe. I don't know if I'm offending you, but no, no, no. Me and me and Uncle Ramsey, we're still cool, man. We're still cool. <laughs> but no, no, I, I, I totally do understand. I totally do understand. See why, 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 uh, why this, this always comes up for me. That was rich dad, poor dad opened my mind in terms of like thinking big and mindset, etc. But the practicality of what do I need to do on a day to day basis. Rich Dad didn't even touch that, right? At all. So, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. And that's where I think Dave Ramsey did did or helped me out tremendously in a time where I was I, I was I didn't know exactly what to do, what direction to go in. I didn't have access to great coaches in terms of investing in finance, general finance uh, 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 overall, like like you guys are providing folks. So I, I the closest thing I had was was that, and it, I mean, quite frankly, saved it saved me in terms of the basics, right? Get out of all types of debt, you know, establish uh, a savings uh, position, and then to to start have creating cash flow to actually start investing and acquiring assets. Yeah, he again, he's got a quality strategy, man. It's worked ever <laughs> since 1960, right? Like it's, a, it's a qual, it's a quality <laughs> strategy. They, they, it's 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 been working since uh, Moby Dick was was a guppy. <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> So, right. You can't be traditional. You can't beat right. You can't beat it. And then again, it's where most people are. We understand that Uncle Dave talks to a certain demographic. But again, just like David said, like if you want if you want different than the, the masses, like you have to do different than the masses. Right. And so you have to continue to take advice and learn money from a different level, not to just get out of poverty, but then to actually build wealth. And the thing that I always say to this, David, is like, yes, the investing is necessary, but there is a, a part of a safe, liquid foundation that people need as a cushion. Because a lot of times what happens is in the goal, and this is in my experience, right, being kind of around people in the financial coaching, financial planning space for, for, for some time, but like most people don't actually have the habit of investing because inevitably they have to pull out of their investment at some point in time, right? And that defeats the purpose of investing. But that's what happens in people's lives, right? If let's say you have no emergency fund, you got nothing really set aside and you dump money into a, into some form of investment accounts, right? And again, it can be lower risk, but at the end of the day, you're still risking some. Always. And if you, Right? And if you continue to do that, and then all of a sudden you take a a life setback, you get sick, you know, you lose a job or the business goes down or something crazy happens, right? Then all, all of a sudden you can't invest as much, right? And you can't like, uh, and a lot of times that stuff's not liquid. So if you do pull out, right, it might be bad timing. It might not be the time for you to touch that money, but now you're having a real like financial crisis. So you need money. That's where having a cushion or something set aside is crucial because in any foundation, right, you got to have some safety. And then so normally the strategy we break down for people is something we call short, mid, long, right? So short term is your six months, your emergency fund that's just set aside. You can put it in a high yield savings account, right? Like at the time of recording this in, in April of 2023, you can get a high yield savings account for 5%, 6% potentially, right? Because the banks want your money. So this might that could be a place for just some liquid money to set aside. Um, and then your long term, right? Whatever you're growing in your 10, 15 year, your nest egg, the thing that you're getting compound interest in, and it can have some risk on it. But then you really build in your midterm, right? Your two to 10 year, the thing that you're going to flip, the thing that you can put 20, 30, $40,000 in and get it to 200,000 or 300,000. Like that's similar. It sounds like what, you know, you're doing with your, with, with your students and like with the people that you're coaching is because if you're able to grow that amount of money, right, it's kind of these midterm investments that allow you to really kind of accelerate it a little bit more. Is that, would that make 
kind of no, you, no, you hit it on the head. I, yeah. I think long term is what what allows you to compound for real. Yeah. But the midterm is what allows you to get those big bumps if you're if you're intelligent about it. If you yeah. can understand how the market moves and everything like that, your swings are gonna. That's that's kind of the word for it. The midterms are called more swings, right? So mm -hmm. day trading, swing trading, and then long term investing. Yeah, absolutely, and that's all just inside of the equities asset class, right? Just talking stocks. And I'm sure you know some people dive over into real estate or some people dive into other forms of like venture capital or commodities or other things. Um, but when we have the investing conversation, I think people, back to your point could be, sometimes it is information overload where it's like you have all these options, but you don't know what bucket it goes in, how much you should go there, right? Like, you know what I mean? So I think that's, that that could be I think cleared you, up. I think you guys are both, quite frankly, may have lost some people just now. <laughs> Honestly. Ah. And it's not it's not because you don't explain it well. It's just because people get overwhelmed. You know, yeah, if you're not in that world, and I think uh, I think you know that's why both of the services that you guys provide is is critically important. Uh, now, I guess you know my question my question a little bit for both of you guys is looking at that mid uh, term investing, right? What vehicle? You know, I think a lot of people have this question, like what vehicle is best for me? Like, the, I, should everybody be in stocks? Should be looking in real estate? Should we look at uh, a, a, a starting their own business? So they so they own their, what what vehicle? And we talk about this quite a bit. And Chris, feel free to add or take away anything I'm saying here. Yeah. But we talk about that. You've got your your income coming in. You're like whatever that is, whether that's a nine to five, whatever that is, right? That mid part right there the mid mid section investing whatever you guys want to call mm -hmm. it you know you clarify this this is your field what is what is the best vehicle yeah it is this your thing right what is the best vehicle right there right is it stocks is it real estate is it what what is, what is that vehicle for most people that you guys see go ahead Dave. i think the best so my advice to anybody who's just starting from zero you will you got to invest in yourself you got to invest in those skills mm. We did not pump that, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead, brother. No, nah, but that's that's just it's just facts. You have to you have to invest in yourself first because those skills, whatever they are, it doesn't matter what it is, bro. Like if it's learning forex, if it's learning um, about fitness, if it's learning about emotional things, family ties, whatever it is. If you start learning about certain things, you yourself become valuable, no matter what the market is. You know, I, I always tell people, I'm like, bro, if internet cuts out right now and it just goes to just one-on-one -on -one work, I'm so, I, I've invested so much in myself that I know that I could do anything and I'd yeah. be, I, I would still be able to maintain my income. So the first thing you really need to educate yourself on personally is sales and marketing. You got to figure those two things out because they're critical in just money creation. Yeah, that, those are the two things. If I were to say if the most important thing to invest in to get the biggest yield in the shortest amount of time is that because that'll bring cash flow. Once you get cash flow, then I would say stocks just because it's a little bit lower barrier to entry. Um, and then for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, you got to get into real estate just because that's the only thing that will never lose no matter what. Unless, no, it'll never lose ever. <laughs> it could, right? Markets, but in general. Wars, that's the only Wars. basket, right? If somebody were to come and take your land, like deproperty you, that's probably the only way because regardless, price of land will always go up. You just got to- yeah. Assuming yeah. you bought it correctly. Yeah, exactly. No, even if you bought it bad. Even if you uh, bought it bad. Even if you bought a house at three times what it's worth 10 years ago, you already made your money back. Pe people take losses on houses a lot, <laughs> right? Like they take losses because it I is about timing, right? I would be curious. I would be curious what that mechanism is. Um, and we may be getting a little too granular here, but I'll be curious what that mechanism of taking that loss on the houses. Cause I see what you're saying there and I tend to agree. Um, that I've been, if I do have a background, in any of this, it is in real estate, real estate agent worked with a firm for a while. Um, so, but I think if bought correctly, I would agree if bought incorrectly, I don't have experience with that. So I can't really say, but if bought correctly, I 1000% agree with you. I would want to hear how, cause yeah, Chris, tell me how you, unless it's like a flip, right? So I'm not talking about fixes and flips. Yeah. I'm not talking about anything like that. Like in, in a 10 year period, how could you lose on real estate? Uh, it's a lot to actually break down right now in like the, this format, but if you really think about it and if you go through this, I've done this illustration before of like putting in, getting a mortgage, right? And getting, 
I've put the numbers together where you like you get a 500 that you buy a $500,000 house. And if in 10 years it goes up to $750,000 in value, you actually by the numbers still lose money on that transaction with the cost of maintenance, with the interest payments that you're paying with um, taxes, um, uh, cost of like, you know, doing the actual deal. Like when you actually break it down and go through the numbers, even if that house appreciated by $250,000, the owner would still technically lose money. So like there are a ton of ways that people lose money in every asset class. But that's still not a loss unless they sold, right? Well, that's but that's what most people look to do at some point because that's how you realize the asset, right? Like you, that's where you, that's where my that's where my key point is, right? My key point is like at the end of the day, could you make a bad decision on stocks on anything? Yes, of course, you could buy anything. But yeah. my my key point is no matter how bad of a decision, right? Let's just say you buy it three times for what it's worth, right? The house is worth a hundred thousand. You pay three hundred thousand for it, yeah. which happened in Orlando, which has happened in in, in plenty of places, right? Even if you pay taxes, even if you pay this, let's just say we just add an extra five years, you'll eventually win no matter what you just have to hold. And that's kind of my, my, my like big anchor on the whole, like if, if, unless you sell at a loss, which it wouldn't even matter, even if you got a good deal, if you sell at a loss, you're still going to fuck yourself. Right, 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 right. I, 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 th I think it's a really interesting point. Cause I do, I do kind of agree with that. I do kind of agree with that. Um, my caveat is I, 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 my caveat would be, did you buy it well? Because I, I think you're going to struggle quite a bit, right? <laughs> you're going to be holding for a long, time in, a long a, time in some circumstances if you didn't buy it correctly. Um, yeah. But with that said, though, this is really interesting. This is why we bring folks on the show, because I think mm -hmm. we have perspectives and things that would like to get uh, expanded upon or even or even um, push back on, because I think it's good for the it's good for the public uh, and the people that yeah. are watching the show to really. Get, get look at this thing from there's, multiple different perspectives. There's more than one way to right skin a cat. People, ah, like that. leave the cat. I know, alone. I know. People don't like that. <laughs> right? Leave the cat. But, but but there's more more than one way to do anything, right? Especially when we're coming down talking about building wealth and yeah. right getting ourselves to a place where uh, our financial goals are met. And so there's a bunch of different areas. And to yeah. kind of wrap up and answer that question again, just like what are the midterm? It's really about what you want like out of an investment it's what how much you actively want to manage something how much energy you want to put into something where do you want to get expertise right some people may not want to ever read a pnl of a company but they're okay to look at an excel spreadsheet for their rental property Right. Like you just never know kind of what people's skill set are. Somebody might want to run a business and be in the operations and be day to day. And somebody else might prefer to just look at a screen and trade. Right. Like the the actual graph. So it really just depends how active and what type of skill set people want to learn in investing. I think that's fair. I agree. Fair. Yeah. With, with the closing question, though, bring us home here, Dan. Closing question here. You've already mentioned two books. Uh, so if you've had any more, any other additional resources, uh, and then let's leave us with like your top, your top, uh, your top tip, right. To, uh, and who, I know you're speaking to veterans, but specifically, like, are there any other characteristics of individuals that should reach out to you and, and connect with you? And then what's the best way to kind of connect? So throwing all of it out. Good to great. Good to great is a great book for, for anybody who's, you know, trying to get into entrepreneurship and who's just trying to understand how things work. Um, that's a great book. Um, and then essentialism. Essentialism is a powerful, powerful book. I got a tattooed. That was the last tattoo I ever got. It was an wow. image from from essentialism, and Ooh. it was something that I was like, I wish I, I wish it would show a lot better. But oh, I, it see, I see, we can see. And so, um, essentialism, essentialism, uh, good to great. Um, as far as uh, a tip, I, I think I might, I, I'll, I'll say it in a in a saying better because it goes better that way. Um, if you get a if you get a, a ten thousand gallons of water and you dump it over a rock, nothing will happen, you know. But if you get a single droplet and you drop a single droplet every single day over ten thousand days, you'll split that rock in half. A lot of times we go for intensity. Really, what we need to do is have consistency. If we really want to break a rock, we got to have consistency. 
Um, as far as military members, I, I, I'm really niche, you know, like other people have, I worked with other people, but I prefer to just work with veterans. Um, I really like the military space. I really like, you know, the community and just how we talk and how we act between each other. So veterans, active duty, anybody in military DOD, welcome along. Um, and if you do want to reach me, the best place to reach me is probably Instagram, which is at David Plaza, just like you see there, 6FV which is uh, for Six Figure Vet. David, we appreciate you taking the time out tonight and jumping on and, uh, again, giving us some insight on uh, what what Six Figure Vet does, how you got to this place, who you're serving. Uh, again, us all being here in this financial space could be over in the health side of things, but all oh, of this wow. is the stuff. I know, could right? be over like, there. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the outcast on this show, man. You're the outcast on this show. Right. But us over here in the wealth space and right, this financial space, uh, we, we, we all do something. We all have somebody to serve. And uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and, and blessing our audience with the uh, information, man. I appreciate you guys having me on here. Chris, I, I'm, I hope to connect a lot more with you. Kobe, I'm a huge fan of your work. I love what you do. I, I love anything that has to do with biohacking. I love all that shit. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I feel very grateful to be here with you guys. Such a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and for being so flexible. You dropped a lot of value today. Guys, go ahead and give him a follow. Join our group, too. We're going to try to – he doesn't know this yet. We're going to try to bring him back to, to, to spread some of this good knowledge in the, in the group here as well. Um, right. But super excited, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like we really got a lot out of this episode. And if you did, let, let David know. Let us know. Uh, and, and show a little bit of love because we do, do, we do a lot of this out of love. Uh, and then also the, uh, to make a lot of money. Now I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number one: Do not make a do not start a podcast to make a lot of money. <laughs> that's right. Seriously. Yeah. Oh, that's great stuff. Cool. Well, David, we we appreciate ha having you on, man. Um, so enjoy the rest of your night, and we'll definitely get a chance to get, get connected soon. Okay. Appreciate you guys. Take Thank care, you. man. Yeah, man. I was sitting. Yeah, I was saying before the show. Oh, man. You know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll kind of end when when the when the good value drops. And apparently, never it never really dropped. So <laughs> that's right. I hope you guys really enjoy that. That was a good episode. Absolutely right. It's always good to have these financial conversations. There's so many different angles that allow you to get to the good life. We just want to again introduce the people uh, that might have a different thought, different idea about how to get there. And so, uh, always good to hear the perspective, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And, uh, right. If you're a veteran, if you um, fit that fit that uh, a space or that that group, feel free to reach out. I think it'll be a lot of help to you. Absolutely. All right, y'all. I think that was it, man. Until next time. Peace.